we have an amazing group to discuss what it's like to launch a hedge fund in the current environment and some of the things you need to know about becoming an emerging manager. Let me introduce the panel from your left to right. Mike Rockefeller is co-founder of the $6 billion long short equity fund Woodline Capital. Previously, he was a successful PM at Citadel. Uh, Woodline launched in 2019, is that right? right? With $2 billion. Alana Weinstein is the founder of the IDW Group. It's one of the top head, head hunters in the world of hedge funds. She just celebrated her 20th anniversary uh, with the firm. Uh, and if you read in big moves between funds, who got hired, who jumped ship, very often IDW is the mover and shaker behind the scenes. Tom Wagner is the co-founder of the $10 billion credit and event-driven fund, Nighthead Capital. Recently, he acquired the UK Birmingham Soccer League and Stadium, as well as an interest in a pickleball team with Tom Brady. Um, and I misread the lineup, so I'm gonna say Brennan Diaz is the founder of the $1 billion Fernbridge Capital firm. He hails from previous firms Viking and Junto, and he launched Fernbridge in late 2020. Good, good timing. Um, taking a hedge fund approach to long only investing. Um, we have about 50 minutes, and if there's time at the end, we'll see if there are any questions from the audience. But let's just start by talking about the current environment. It's been a crazy couple of years from the pandemic to the new regime of rate increases. Frame what's going on in today's uh, environment and what's it like managing a fund in this sort of circumstance. Let, let's start with you. Sure, Mike. so uh, I think one theme is that allocators are becoming uh, more sophisticated about the return quality that they are receiving and what they're willing to pay for. And what they want is uncorrelated alpha. And you, you take that concept, but then you look at the traditional long short hedge fund and they are running portfolios of less than 30% IDEO which means that th those returns are highly dependent on macro factors, very unpredictable um, factors that, um, that you'll be subject to. And what I think is an increasing appreciation is that a high IDEO portfolio is what is predictive for an uncorrelated alpha stream. And that is why you're seeing uh, the massive increase in multi-manager um, assets. And those assets have more than doubled since 2017. If you look at some of the top launches that are coming out in 2023, Ilex and Freestone, uh, that trend looks to be con continuing. And the reason why is that a multi-manager provides a one-stop shop for an allocator where you can get a high ADO, low vol, durable return stream, and you can do it in one single investment where, where you could have scale and you uh, eliminate complexity. Diversification built in right from, from the get-go. That's right. Um, Alana, let's talk a little bit about this current environment. You yeah. see it from the perspective of talent. Tell us, tell us what you're seeing. Well, I'm going to zoom out because if you all want to start a hedge fund, I think we need to kind of start at the top and I'm going to give you the macro and then we'll go quickly strategy by strategy. Uh, Barry, you and I talked about this recently. There was, to me at least, an amazing article that the FT put out a couple months ago which said, this was news to me. I knew there were a lot of hedge funds, but apparently there are more hedge funds than Burger Kings. Okay? True. 30,000 hedge funds. Um, the other thing you should keep in mind is that the average lifespan of a hedge fund is three years. So if you guys want to start a fund and you don't want it to be just another Burger King that goes out of business, you need to understand what the lay of the land is within each of those strategies. Mike talked a little bit about long short equities. Not to be like the Grim Reaper, but the reality is if you're not a multi-manager and you're not aggressively managing market risk, then you fall into the category of a long short uh, single manager that probably takes concentrated, more concentrated directional risk and if you look at how these funds have performed over the last two full years, 21 and 22, the average, the cumulative return of these funds is down 
okay, with some funds down as high as 60%, like Tiger Global. So if you think about the dollars lost to LPs, and it's important you understand this because 40% of the hedge fund universe is long short equities. So I'm betting there's a decent percentage of you here that is thinking about starting a long short equity fund. There was a tremendous amount of AUM lost. So Tiger Global pre-2021 was 100 billion. Maverick, 14 billion. D1, 30 billion, and then non-Tiger Cubs like Alkion, 30 billion, Perceptive, 10 billion. When you're down 40% on average, it's a huge loss to the industry. More than 50% of total losses in, two, in 2022 came from long short equity funds, and half of hedge fund liquidations came from long short equity funds. So you really need to think about if you don't fall into a all alpha, non-correlated category, like Mike does, what is the value that you're providing? Macro, very volatile return stream. 2021, crappy year for most macro funds. 2022, great year. 23 again, not such a good year. Um, and you see, again, brand name funds like Rocos, Castle Hook, Element. Element charged 40% fees, was able to up it to that in 2020 shrinking and trying to stem the bleeding from negative returns. Um, credit, a bright spot, but I think, and I'm sure Tom will talk more about this, you really need scale to compete. And then there's the multi-managers, and that's gonna be your biggest problem as a new emerging manager, how you're going to compete for talent within a paradigm that has everything to offer, from analysts up through to PMs, they have scale, they have capital, they have resources, they have a pathway to be a PM, they have an aggressive payout, they have economics, and they are like, it's like mitosis. You know, we used to have, we had the tiger cubs, now we have the multi-manager cubs. Mike is one of them, he mentioned Ilex, I hope it's okay I share, that you, he is now providing strategic investments to multi-manager funds. Um, Ilix are two guys from Citadel that Mike and his team gave capital to, and they're going to launch with two billion. Freestone Grove, another Citadel guy, is going to launch with many billions. Uh, Andrew Comery, who came out of D.E. Shaw, is launching with three billion. So into the fray, so this is the environment you're entering into, and I, as, I as someone who has been recruiting um, in this industry for the past 20 years with my team, and we're working with the biggest, most successful funds in the world, it's tough. Talent is scarce. It's, they have many options. Um, and I think the multi-manager dynamic just makes it that much more intense. So, so let me see what Brennan has to say about this. You're the only long only person on, on the panel. Is it that challenging to be long only or how are you finding this environment from, from your investment style? Well, I mean, I think all the points Mike made are, are right. And I think that the, the whole rationale behind launching a long only coming from a long short background was the realization that um, market structure was changing, the ability to access short alpha and short alpha curves were changing, and thus the ability to maintain short gross exposure with the same investment style and generate that level of alpha wasn't there as much. And so I kind of felt that pressure on the short side of the portfolio forcing shorts or a running higher net, kind of two bad options for an absolute return product, um, but looked at the long side of the ledger and still felt very strongly that the pool of alpha we were accessing there looking out, you know, basically 18 to, 18 to 36 months, so not looking out five to 10 years, but 18 to 36 months forward, looking forward to what underlying businesses were gonna be earning and thinking about absolute value and intrinsic value and taking big concentrated bets on, um, on opportunities that were really attractive, but that window was not only kind of as attractive as it's ever been, but in some ways is getting more attractive, kind of driven by the underlying short-term volatility in the market. Um, and so I don't think managing a long only is, is, is more difficult than managing a long short. I think it's actually materially, materially easier, which is kind of why the, we went down that, that route. And I also think that there's material demand. I think Mike's point is 100% right that allocators want to pay for value. Right, um, you know, investors historically have not been, you know, invested in hedge funds just to, to, to pay fees on beta. They've been willing to pay the fees on beta because the underlying assumption would be that you would deliver them enough alpha to cover the beta cost. Um, however, there are, you know, large pools of capital in the world that want beta exposure. Um, very, very large pools of capital that will always have beta exposure. And so I think the 
the, the message of going to people and saying, I will take that beta exposure. I personally want that beta exposure for my own capital. Like over time, I, I want the beta because the beta collecting that risk premium should be positive. Uh, and you only pay me when I generate value for you. Value being defined as excess returns relative to the S&P. I think that has a lot of resonance with, um, with, with, with a lot of capital providers out there. And I think that it, it, it's, it's an opportunity for um, people who invest like me, who think like me, to, uh, to, to, go out and, uh, to go out and execute on if they so choose. Um, but you, you, know, you have to have the right model. You have to have um, a, a truly aligned fee structure. Uh, and, you, and, you, and you have to kind of be willing to go down that road. So I, I, that, you know, I think it's in many ways the same, it's, 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 it's responding to the same trend that, that Mike is talking about and, and taking it in a different direction. So, so to clarify, some people have called them pivot fees. The, the profit participation is only on returns over and above what the SPX is generating. So it's actually, uh, I would say, even more advantageous in that our management fees are, are a prepayment on future alpha. Mm -hmm. So we have to generate alpha before we get to um, uh, any type of incentive, right? So the, the idea is over time, over the life of the fund, uh, which hopefully is a very long life, um, when, you, when, we, when we end at the end, we will look back and 70% of the economics uh, of the alpha that has been generated will, will flow to the investors and 30% will accrue to the manager. Um, and, and we try to make that as clean and transparent as possible. Um, that creates more volatility in our, um, in our, in our overall incentive fee income relative to, to other models. Um, but I think that's very solvable from a talent perspective, how to kind of talk about that. Uh, but that's the underlying model. Really interesting. Tom, what do you make of this current environment and how are you finding the world of credit uh, within within the hedge fund realm. Well, I uh, first of all thank you, Barry, for having me here and for everyone attending. Um, appreciate it. You know, credit is um, relative to every other asset class we see today, and we invest. We have a of our ten billion, six of it is permanent capital. So we we do a lot beyond just credit. We can do basically anything anywhere in the world we want. But credit today, and particularly private structured credit, so rescue financings, bridge loans, um, uh, financings to provide uh, growth capital, you know, all structured as credit, offer the greatest amount of alpha relative to the risk I've ever seen in the 25 years I've been doing this. There's, it's extraordinary excess return. Wow. And that's because it's not liquid. And one thing that I think all of you or those of you in the room that are contemplating launching a hedge fund is there is an extreme push-pull presently for liquidity vis-a-vis -vis returns. Um, investors uh, or allocators are not liquid and uh, they need to generate returns, particularly in a context of higher rates where their hurdles have all gone up and they're stuck in older investments, particularly private equity. They're probably going to take a period of time to recover to the alpha generative returns that they had historically produced. So they want you to be liquid and generate returns. That's not really possible today. Um, so you've got to find a niche that fits you. And I think the best advice that I could give for folks thinking about launching is to forget all the noise. Forget what the markets want. Forget what the LPs want. Do what you're going to be good at. It doesn't matter what your strategy is. doesn't matter what your structure is. doesn't matter what your fees are. If you're good relative to whatever benchmark you're posted against, you'll do just fine. Your business will grow, you'll make plenty of money, you'll retire a happy person, your kids will do, never have to work if they don't want to, you'll do just fine. But if you try to shoehorn yourself into something that doesn't fit, it'll go terribly wrong. And I think the, the second most valuable piece of advice I can give you is separate from all the examples you're hearing up here of all these multi-billion dollar launches. That's not normal. Right? It's not normal. And you might think you're going to launch with a billion dollars. Alana helped us get started. We thought we were going to launch with a billion five as of March 16th, 2008. We had just come out of the Emerging Managers Conference Time at Goldman. Timing was perfect. I was like, this is so easy. It's been eight weeks. We raised a billion and a half. We're going to launch with three billion. Ken Griffin was backing us. It was like the greatest thing ever. Next day, Bear Stearns went bankrupt, and by the time we launched on June 3rd, 2008, we had 413 million in capital. <laughs> and the world just changed. Nothing happened with us. All the investments we were pursuing was good. We're, our first couple of years were spectacular, like everything went great, and things turned out okay. But that second piece of advice is you can't bank on being a multi-billion dollar launch. And so what does that mean? That means you have to do everything. 
You better understand how to set up a computer on a phone. You better know how to debug your computer. You better know how to answer the phones politely. You should know how to make good coffee for your LPs when they stop by. You're going to be doing all of it. Like, don't kid yourself. And if you don't launch with billions of dollars of capital locked up for a multi-year period, you run a lot of risk that you create a cost structure that's incompatible with where your capital could be, not where it is today. So I would advise that you do what you're good at and learn how to do everything well and work really, really hard and stick to it for a period of time. And if you love it, it'll work out. So, so let's address the issue you just touched on, that subscale operations. How do you compete for talent in the most competitive market in the world when you can't write giant checks and you're running subscale? Let, let's start with you. Well, sure. he, he never ran subscale, <laughs> let's be clear. Um, but on but, a relative basis, yeah, you know, you, it was only $2 billion. Only two. So. Well, you know, there's a great uh, movie that uh, came out in 1989. So uh, uh, some of you might not have known it, but Field of Dreams. And um, if you haven't seen it, the, uh, the main character, Ray Kinsella, who's played by Kevin Costner, um, he's out in the middle of his cornfield and he hears a voice. If you build it, he will come. And he doesn't know what build it is, but he decides to build a baseball field in, in his cornfield. Um, and lo and behold, a bunch of dead baseball players show up at his house and start playing baseball. And you should have the mindset of what that movie tells you, which is if you build it, they will come. If you have a differentiated value proposition, people will invest. And you know, this, this panel is a great representation because it's all different strategies. We're all, but we, what we have and what people forget is what we're offering is a product. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, why am I here? What is the product that I'm offering? And what customer base is gonna want this product? And if you invest early in your infrastructure, if you hire before you have capital, not after, then I think that you will get that capital. And you know, my, my good friend Brandon Haley, who launched Holocene, he, in 2017, had over two dozen employees without a zero, with, with zero dollars. And he ended up uh, being a, gigan a gigantic launch because he sold that story to investors. So that's the mindset I would take. I, I, I think the difference, though, Mike, is you're, you were coming from Citadel. Brandon was coming from Citadel. People were willing to come before you built it because they knew what each of you represented. I, as a, uh, a, a we as a firm are very loath. I'll be I'll be candid with you to do work with emerging managers because the truth is. Most of you are not launching with billions of dollars. You, you're probably not even launching with hundreds of millions of dollars. And given how competitive the talent market is, it's very hard for really talented people to get behind you with no proof of concept. Because they're making two bets on you that, that are beyond the scope of what they're, the bets they're normally making. They're making a bet on you as a new founder. You've never done this before. And they're making a bet that you can scale, that you are worth getting in the trenches with and, and, and that you can grow. And I guess the good news, bad news about my, unfortunately, it's, just, it's not a prediction, it's just a fact of life. Very few of you will launch with scale is if you're under 250 million, I actually don't think you need to worry about this. You guys may disagree with me. But if you're a really small fund, and many of you may start with 25 million or 50 million or 100 million, you can hire junior people. You can hire people out of the sell side. You can hire people um, out of banking. And they're moldable. And they'll be thrilled to have a seat at the table. And I also think it's, it's difficult, unless people know you and have worked with you before, you know, the, the whole other set of things is, are you a good mentor? Can you develop them? Are you gonna, going to pay them fairly? Um, are they joining something special with a great culture? Is there a runway? These are all the sets of things we deal with in helping people cross the divide to go from where they are to a large established manager and get them comfortable on all those points. And so that's also there. And if they haven't worked with you, you know, they, they don't really know what the odds are that it's going to be a good fit. And you, in turn, also don't want to bring on board senior people that you don't really know and have to give them substantial points in the fund, and then it may not work out. 
And if you end up with the high class problem of achieving scale, then we get into the um, setting up an economic structure which is going to be attractive to your investment staff. And I'd say the one guiding principle on that is, and it's a good thing, as a newer fund, the value creation for everyone working there should come at a massively different pace than sitting at a large established player where much of that value has already been created. So what do I mean by that? If let's call it 25 to 30 percent gets paid out to the investment and leadership team, uh, this is on average and this is a back of the envelope uh, thought, but I, I think directionally it's true. Um, here, you should be talking about 30 percent at going to 50 percent to the extent that the people you hire, and again, this is further on down the road once you have scale and can attract um, more senior credible people, to the extent that they put up great performance, they can hire and develop people, then you're able to take on more capital and you're creating more value. But at the end of the day, everyone is going to reference you within an inch of your life. And the same way LPs are going to want to get a point of view on you, talent will too. And there's what you're telling them up front, which hopefully is attractive, but even more attractive is the path forward. And you don't want them discounting any of the promises or vision that you're giving them because of what they're hearing in the market. So that's something to bear in mind and I think really critical as you, uh, at both in the, less so maybe in the immediate term, but certainly as you progress and are trying to reach out to really talented, established people. Brent, are you finding the same sort of circumstances when you're competing for talent? What, what's, what's your journey been like? Well, I think it, it's a little bit, focused on the type of talent you're recruiting, right? So I come from a world in a lineage of funds where we don't hire experienced people, um, where there's a kind of fundamental viewpoint in the firms I've worked at that we hire people that are less experienced and we train and develop them. Um, and that obviously aligns easier when you're subscale, um, but that that's not, I didn't make the decision because of scale, that's just how the world I come from does things. I think though, to Alana's point, you have to be realistic about what the envelope of, of what you can spend is, what that looks like, and that what the talent you can get with that and align against that. So you, you have to be really kind of thoughtful about, you know, to Tom's point earlier, what is what am I what do I want to do? What does my strategy look like? What does that business plan look like? What am I capable of of doing from a development and a mentoring and a leadership perspective? Uh, and then how does that work from an economic perspective, both in terms of day one, but also to Alana's point, what does it look like over time? what does that economic trajectory look like with, with success as you go? And I think you want to be transparent with people around what day one looks like, what that can evolve to over time, and what are the parameters that, that trigger that evolution. Um, and I would say the other thing that's you know, fundamentally different is that the analysts, I would guess, at all of our firms are probably doing, you know, they're all being analysts, but they're probably doing slightly different things. The, the job is not the same at every firm. Um, and I think that you, you want to be clear in terms of the way you're going to invest, the types of things that the analysts will be expected to do, um, and that will there'll be some natural self-selection of firms that of, of individuals that that want to have that that think they can be more su or less successful in different environments. And and let me follow up when you talk about hiring people and mentoring them and shaping them, is it just analysts or is it traders and PMs and others within within the fund? Um, I would say my general point of view uh, is that it's, it's pretty much true across the entirety of the firm that when I think about the firms that I've worked with, in, uh, worked with in the past that have been successful and you look at the people that have been highly successful there, um, none of them were really senior hires coming in. They were, they were hired pretty junior and they were trained and developed within those firms and in a lot of those firms some of the biggest hiring mistakes they've ever made we're more senior. Now that's, that, mm -hmm. that's true for our process. That's not true for everyone else's process. Um, and, and so I think that there's always been a natural um, pull towards you know, going younger and less experienced and training and developing those people. Um, and that just makes it easier for me in the current environment because I'm not competing against, you know, the type of people that Alana's. Well, you're also not injecting a fully formed 
humans, so to speak, and our business into the ecosystem, and you don't know I, if the tissue is going to reject the organism. It almost the, certainly will. The, <laughs> <laughs> um, the one other thing, though, is as a new manager without much capital, just bear in mind, LPs are making a bet on you. They're making a bet on you as a manager, not on the bench yet, if you're launching with just a small amount of capital. Interesting point. Tom, you've been doing this for a while. What's your experience been uh, competing for talent and either hiring or, or building at home? Yeah, it's, um, it's really challenging. It's always the, the toughest part of the business, I think. Well, second, raising the money. That, that's, that's probably, you know, uh, parting dollars from people. We have long lockups, and a lot of it's really long, so that's, that's always the longest process. But, you know, I think it's a, uni it's a unique challenge today because there's been a shift over the last, you know, 15 years that we've run Nighthead um, where a new generation of professionals are coming into the industry or, or have come into the industry that expect a lot more sooner. Um, and I think this is, you know, uh, this is pretty common across the, you know, generation of folks that are, say, 25 to late 30s years old. And that's difficult because if you think about the last 15 years, we've gone 15 years without a recession, really. And that means you really don't know what you're doing. Because if you have, yes, you invested in one year with a rate rise, okay, but you still haven't invested in a recession. So it's really hard to get people that have experience that are relatively junior that have a perspective of how bad things can be. Right, and, and uh, we've, we've learned what happens with higher rates, or we're beginning to learn what happens with higher rates, which not even I or people substantially more experienced than I am have contended with. It hasn't happened since the, the late 70s. And so, you know, we're seeing new things. Well, that means that if you have folks that haven't experienced those things, even if they can imagine them, it's different to actually experience them. And so managing people that haven't yet had the experience, the challenge, and for you, as emerging managers, you need to do that in a way that controls risks and keeps people motivated. And that's challenging, right? When they, when they believe that they deserve more, and they have a genuine view that they should have more responsibility, more seniority, more economics, but they haven't yet been battle tested, that's a tough dynamic. And it's one that you really need to be very thoughtful about in how you manage. I would say don't cave to the pressure, you know, find the right people that understand that it's a process. They've got to be committed to building the business alongside you or it's going to come crumbling in, a, in upon itself. I think the other thing that's notable that we've seen recently is there's some really high cost structures in the hedge fund world, you know, like 8% fixed cost. <laughs> like that's insane, like insane. Um, that, that is not the way to start and run a business. If you're, if you have, your fixed costs meaningfully above your guaranteed fees, and then you adjust for loss of capital, right? If you can't build that cushion in, you're at risk. Like, just look at yourself like a business. Would you invest in that business? Because your LPs are gonna look at it the same way. They say, what happens if I allocate to this business? Like, I don't wanna be like everybody, you know, running for the door, and if I'm the, you know, the ant and the elephant's behind me, it's not gonna be a good day. So, you know, you have to think about the, the, the cost structure, which aligns with how you manage the people, which aligns with what type of people to hire. So it's a, it's a multivariable analysis, um, which I'm definitely not smart enough to solve, but it's, you know, for me, it's a feel. You know the types of folks that you can hire that you think will be a good fit. And I think it's incumbent on new managers to think about, okay, who, who do I want to have effectively in the trenches you know, with you? Because I think the reason a lot of firms fail in that first three to five year period is because they build themselves or they expect stratospheric growth. And the reality is it can be really lumpy, right? You just don't know. You know, our experience is a good one. We, we launched, we thought we were gonna have tons of capital. We had less, the markets fell off a cliff. And I mean like fell like really, really off a cliff. And no one, we didn't expect that, but we built the business to be able to withstand that. And then we grew, you know, really rapidly after that because we set up for you know, what if everything goes wrong? So I threw a lot into the mix there, but I think all of these things are important considerations when you're hiring. It can go great. You can build for huge success and have it, and that's fantastic. But the odds are that that won't happen. Either the markets won't give it to you, the personnel won't be there, um, you know, the capital won't come in the way that you expect. So if you build for a sense of conservatism and you build a buffer around your business, you know, you'll get to escape velocity. Hmm. Really interesting. I I'm intrigued by 
anyone who's working for you who was born after, before, if they were born after 1987, they've never experienced a recession in their professional right. career. It's pretty, right. pretty, pretty amazing. So, so let's talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned your LPs. How do each of you differentiate yourself? What's your selling point when you're either trying to bring in capital or hire somebody or in any other way make yourself differentiated from the masses that are out there? Let's start with you, Mike. Sure. So, so our view is and was that the successful funds in the next decade are those uh, that will be durably built businesses. As Tom mentioned, you know, you have to think about this as a business, and those that can attract, retain, and develop talent uh, with a competitive advantage. And uh, you know, this past weekend there was a Formula One race in in Monaco. So I'll use that as an example because. Um, a durable, successful hedge fund is a lot like an F1 racing team, right? You, you have the racers, you have your investment team, that's the DNA of your business, but without a great car, you can't win races. And behind those cars, okay, you have mechanics, engineers, strategists, teams of people that are helping, and similarly, the hedge fund of today and, and for the next decade will be a hedge fund that has an infrastructure that can support their investment team, allow them to operate at peak performance, and then run the business of, of a fund. And that's a different job than what all of us here as investment managers do. That's not our expertise. So you have to have that infrastructure, those experts in-house uh, to help you do that. And that I think that has been a big selling point for our LPs in the beginning, but also the talent that we bring in, knowing that we've built this to last. What I'm hearing from you, Mike, is that generating alpha, that's table stakes. That's just what you need to, to sit down. Everything beyond that seems to be um, wh where you separate yourself from the crowd. A absolutely. LPs want to know that they can put capital in. They know it's going to be an illiquid investment and know that they are putting capital into a stable, durable business. And that's what you have to provide them when you launch. Hmm. Alana, you have a unique perspective on differentiators and hedge funds. Tell us what you see from your vantage point. Well, uh, people come in and they meet with us and they talk about what they're going to do. And I will tell you, having seen a gazillion presentations, investor materials, letters, it's great to have that stuff. Um, done in a way which obviously you're going to put time into it, you want to feel proud of it. But at the end of the day, my feeling is this industry is for the most part very commoditized. Um, and the reason I went through the different strategies is to let you know that to the extent you're launching a strategy that has not performed well in the last couple of years, LPs are not going to be, give you the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't matter what your presentation materials look like. It just doesn't. You're going to have to put up performance. And the, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is maybe you, you, know, you can say you're differentiated, all of this stuff. You've got to start investing as quickly as possible. You bang the tin cup for capital for the first three to six months. You do what you can and then stop, literally stop, as counterintuitive as that sounds. Um, what you want to do is start to pr show some proof of concept because unless you are coming from a fund that is a top multi-manager or you're coming from um, uh, a great uh, a fund that is pedigreed and LPs want more of that DNA, like I'll give you another example, um, last year Braidwell launched. That was a fund started by Alex Carnell, that came, who came out of Deerfield and had a huge reputation in healthcare. And he launched with over $3 billion. So unless there's something that LPs can seek, sink their teeth into in terms of the DNA that you carry, you're going to have to show them what you can do. And then yes, it becomes a question of how do you beg, borrow, and steal to fund the enterprise while you're putting up performance so that you can then go back to LPs <laughs> raise capital, and also get better talent, because now this field of dreams has some skin on the bones. Hmm. Brennan, what do you think? What, what is the differentiator for you, for you as a long-only fund manager? 
I mean, I think the, the easy answer is that we're a long only head, uh, manager that's doing concentrated hedge fund like investing, and there's people that do that. So I, I like, but the, the, the field there is a lot smaller. Um, and the pools of capital allocated against long only are, are pretty large. There's a lot of money in passive. There's a lot of money in long, other long only strategies. So it's different than launching, you know, a, a higher fee product like a long short product where you're competing against, you know, the, the, the mics of the world where they're making those trade offs. Um, it, it's a little bit different. I, I would also echo the idea that, uh, in my experience, and not every allocator is the same. Allocators want it to to in, invest in what they perceive as inst institutional scale managers. Doesn't necessarily mean you need to have 30 employees, but they want to they, they want to look at it as a real business. They want to understand the plan. They want to understand how you think about um, the, the 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 growth of the business, the contingencies for the business, what your strategy is, how you're building the culture. Um, because to be perfectly frank, that I think that's the that's the easiest thing to kind of underwrite from an outside perspective. It's always harder to underwrite stock pitches. I I find it hard to underwrite stock pitches if I don't know the stock really really well. Um, and, and and so I think you want to you, you, you want to invest in that part of the business. And what that investment looks like is going to be you know, specific to your strategy, right? It, it looks very different for, for a multi-manager than it, than it does for a smaller uh, organization. But you can still, I would say, get to that level of institutional scale as a smaller manager if you, if you make it a priority and you're thoughtful around how that um, looks both day one and what your communication looks like for what it should be over time. Tom, what's your big differentiator? I don't think we really have one. Um, no, I, I, I think I, there's a great it's quote. Not pickleball. That's not, not pick. No, we're <laughs> yeah, random sports investments. Um, Seth Klarman. I read a great quote by him, I think two weeks ago, and he said, "We're fortunate to be unconstrained by a specific investment strategy." If I remember the quote directly, like, that's so beautiful, right? Because what are you paying bow posts for? You're paying them to go out and find great investments where. There's downside protection. So the way that we present what we do is that we can invest anywhere in the world, really in anything. Um, but everything we do, we take a credit approach to, which is we have an extreme focus on capital preservation. And we try to structure for the best possible returns. Sometimes it's an equity-like return or a linked return or convertible or warrants so we can gain an equity return. But that's really the approach. So every investment that we pursue we take that approach with. The, the investment that we made in the, in the football team um, uh, in the UK was structured as a, as a secured loan with you know, the ability to eventually you know, gain full control. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of the investing that we've pursued has been structured in that way. And, and I think that's a differentiator because it's, it's a little different than investing in somebody that's going to go trade high yield bonds or you know do public distress, and and I think the second thing is at least for my core business, which we started as a distressed debt fund, the distressed debt funds just went off the rails the last 15 years. They the the way that they operate is they they look at a at a business as a carcass, and then approach it to fight over the carcass, right? We look at a business that might be a carcass and say, can we revive that thing, right? Because if you can, the, the pie that you're fighting over grows. And that's a lost art um, for a lot of investors in turnarounds. Like there aren't many real turnaround experts anymore. And that is how you make tons of money, at least in my subsector. And so I think we've done that pretty well. Like we've invested in a few businesses the last few years where we had control that we've turned around. You know, our biggest short going into the COVID was Hertz. It's now our largest long we've ever had in the history of the firm. Wow. Um, and it was a turnaround play, you know, centered around electrification. So, you know, I think you've got, again, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning. You gotta find what you're good at and what you love and then apply it to your strategy and do that. Like, just do that. Forget all the noise. Just do what you love and what you're good at. And the rest of it should, should be okay. But also having a structure that supports what you do is yeah. very advantageous. Yeah. I mean, I don't want this to be lost on you. Of that ten billion, four billion is in an insurance company. Yeah. And the other, and you have what another four? Uh, another two and a half that's in drawdown right. structures. Right. So, so there's no timeline to return in no. capital. You guys, some of our capital is literally the insurance company is permanent, permanent, right. and then one of the drawdown funds, the investor, it's a really like uber wealthy family. Um, when we draw the capital. We never have to give it back. Now, we don't get paid until we give it back, 
but we don't actually have to give it back. And our fee is a sliding, don't steal this by the way. This is like a really good idea. It took a long time to come up with this. The fee is a sliding scale based on the IRR. So there's this weird push-pull, because like, you know, sometimes you do a great investment, you compound at 40 or 35 or 30 for the first 18 months, and then you know you're not gonna continue compounding at that rate. You're probably gonna slide to a lower level. Well, we have to decide do we want to capture the higher incentive fee, or do we want to hold it and make a larger moik? I always go for the larger moik, right? It, like, the worst thing you can do is try to live off of IRRs. It's not, not possible. You can't eat those. Moik is what you want. So that duration of capital is hard, but the dumbest decision I ever made was pursuing long-duration capital. We would be three times larger, four times larger if I had just you know, built a CLO business and listen to Alana and like hired people to direct, do direct lending and do these other things. Well, like, no, I didn't no. tell you to do that. No, but you were like, you always had these good ideas. Like this is what your peers are doing. And, and you had very, very good advice over time that I listened to none of and I'm much poorer for it. Well, but, <laughs> it runs a $10 billion <laughs> fund, so there you go. But no, but it's, we, we, I said, you're going way back, I, I want permanent capital. Because if, I just said, if we have permanent capital, we can do whatever we want. Like we could buy English soccer teams. Now, I said we could do, we could make investments that really compound for a long period of time. And so we focused on doing that. Maybe it was a good decision, and maybe it wasn't. Time will tell. But again, it went back to like, that's what we love. That's what we wanted to but, do. But my point being, it's not just the strategy. It's also the structure you wrap yeah, that yeah, up for in. Sure. You created a structure which is like, I mean, it's almost a mini Apollo. It is, You yeah. created a structure where you just charge on alpha. LPs yeah. can get behind that. It may be long only, but you're just charging on alpha. Yep. And you're all alpha. So, and you have all of the DNA from one of the greatest hedge funds in the world. Yeah. These are things that make each of these guys differentiated to your question and unique. And, and the reality is there are very few individuals that come to market with that skill set and that foresight. So, so since we brought up- You had that back then, that's yeah. true. Since we've brought up LPs and, and allocators, I wanna skip ahead to this question. What's, what's the hardest question that you get asked by your limited partners or allocators? What's the most challenging question they throw at you? We'll start, start with you again, Mike. Yeah, I, I think uh, there are two hard questions. One is, on the topic of exiting people. And you know, that is you know, mostly an objective decision, but there's a lot of subjectivity to it as well. And I think you know, LPs want it to be you know, objective. And it's sometimes uh, you know, hard to explain, uh, explain some of the background to why we might keep somebody versus, versus exit to them. And I think the, the, the second uh, question that uh, they ask and we have a tough time with is just, um, on adapting uh, any strategy that we have. You know, LPs don't want you to adapt and change the business model that you promised, and, that, and, that's, and I think that's completely fair. But there are times that are critical in a fund's life that you need to adapt or you'll die. And so- 2022, for example? <laughs> right, so uh, you know, whatever it may be, uh, that, that is a hard question to answer because you know, most of the time what they wanna hear is don't change your, your path at all. Alana, you want to? Uh, well, I do want to, but I also want to comment on what Mike said. I do, that's true, but when you have however many years of putting up great performance and delivering exactly what you promised LPs, there's a higher receptivity, I think, to then whatever you see the pivot points as. I've seen this with other clients as well. They maybe started as one thing, and as long as they didn't stray too far from their core DNA, I have one client that is now 50 billion, he was 30 billion two years ago, and he's done it through us thinking through cre other strategies mm. and other products that are tangential but still related. And he's got credibility with his LPs because of what he's delivered. Yeah. Um, turnover. Okay, I just have to comment on this because you know, like it's such a it's the bane of my existence, and I think it's one of the biggest problems in our industry. People are terrified. LPs are terrified to fire people. They think somehow it's gonna reflect poorly on their ability to retain a team, their culture, something bad's going on at the fund. You mean GPs are terrified of firing yeah. people? Yeah, but, yeah. L, but they're, they're terrified of what, what LPs, LPs will think. think. Sorry, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be, you have to give people room to fail, and, or to succeed rather, give, give them runway, give them tools, help them develop. But at a certain point, you need to graciously exit them if they're not cutting it. Because the majority of you will not have a pass-through model, okay? I mean, that's just the truth. And you're gonna have a little problem called netting, which is Peter over here, 
I'm going to use just simple illustration. His idea is put up 100 million of PL, and Paul over here lost 100 million. And you're zero. And what you don't want to do, who is Peter and Paul? You don't want to pay from, you don't want to take from this guy to pay that guy. Sorry, take from this guy to pay that guy. Um, because you're going to end up losing your best people. And you also don't want your A's to feel like they're surrounded by a bunch of B's or worse yet C's. Yeah. So you need to manage people who are not cutting it and give them time to succeed. You need to manage them out and don't worry about, about your LPs because at the end of the day, you're going to have a much bigger problem if your stars leave. The, the, the they, they appreciate you cutting your losses you if just, someone just, just is not working out. You have to out. manage talent the way you manage a portfolio. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you, that's mm -hmm. how you have to approach it. You have to be, you have to be rigorous. You have to be, you know, you have to make tough decisions, and you can't worry about anything else. This is the biggest problem. It's not just emerging managers, but in general that I see in our industry. And the best founders, okay, are the ones who do this really, really well. And sometimes, you know, people sort of, they get a bad rep for it, but they're also the best at developing people and giving people the most runway. It's about creating an environment which attracts rock stars. On your question, toughest question, mm -hmm. one of the things you mentioned, Tom, um, uh, mentioned is um, uh, how you're going to pay for resources. So if you have a 2% management fee and you're in a $100 million fund and you come from a fund, we're used to having tens of millions of dollars spent on research and software and data and corporate access. You have to answer the question to LPs as to how you're going to fund that. You can't have, you, you touched on this, you can't have as a $100 million fund a 2% a 2% management fee, and then $1 million spent on fund expenses, because that's a 3% drag on returns out of the gate, and it's even higher if you're, if you're less. And the answer to that question really has to come back to how are you special, okay? You don't need all these data sources. I'm gonna do X, I'm gonna do it really well, and here's what I need, and be very precise about what you're bringing to the table and the resources you need to support that. The reality is you're not competing head on with these funds that spend tens of millions of dollars or even hundreds of millions of dollars on research. Brendan, what's the toughest question you get asked by potential LPs? I'd say during the fundraising process for me, the toughest is always what, what's your target that you're gonna raise, to which my answer is I have no idea. Um, you, you, you tell me, we'll see, I'm gonna launch it and we're gonna see what it is and it'll be what it is. Now I would say that you know, the hardest question I always, and it's a little bit like the last question, is how do you, how do you differentiate yourself versus other funds? Because I always, it's, it's inherent in that question is you have to know what that other fund is doing. And, and like I, I'm a strong believer that unless you're in the walls and you're, unless you understand exactly how the investment process works, it's really hard to compare yourself to another fund. And so I try to turn it back to this, you know, this is how we invest. This is how we do things. You, you compare that to the other people you kind of see in the market. Um, but during the fundraising process for kind of everyone in this room that's about to go through it, um, you know, the, the, the how, what, 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 what's your target for raising, I always found somewhat amusing because I don't think anybody really knows until the last minute. <laughs> Tom, how about you? I'm, I'm looking for a doozy from you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I love the question. Like, what do you see as the great opportunities over the next six months? You're literally like, Really? <laughs> if I knew the answer to that question, I wouldn't need you as an LP, right? I'd already be retired, like managing my own money. In the family. Somebody else would be managing my money in the family office. I'd be a professional fly fisherman. I, you know, I, like March, you know, 16th, 2008, no one knew that we were about to embark on the greatest run of distressed financials we've ever seen, right? September 10th, 2001, no one knew there'd be a huge opportunity in airlines. Um, you know, you just kind of go through history. Like, you just don't know. So I think... My answer to this question generally, and, and playing off a little bit of the other comments is, don't worry about what the LPs think, okay? Just say what you and do what you believe is right for generating returns. Because I'll tell you, particularly as a distressed investor, the LPs are always wrong, always. Like very, very rarely do we make a new investment and, they, and people go, wow, that's great. Usually they're like, oh my God, really? Like, you really think that's a good investment? Like, yes, like, this is what's going to happen. Like, oh, my God, he lost his mind. So I think you have to balance the fact that you're the asset manager. You're the business builder. Just be honest, right, and, and stick to your, your strategy. But don't get swayed by what the crowd thinks. That's, that's a surefire way to fail. 
Let, let's yeah. stay on that end of the uh, panel for, for this question. Tell us the biggest surprise or lesson learned over the years. What, what really sticks with you? As I'm still doing it? No, yeah. I think um, <laughs> the fact that I like it so much. Really? I, yeah. I, I, I came from, you know, I was on a sell side trading floor with a thousand people and it was sort of like, you know, very collegial, lots of interpersonal reaction, interaction, very loud, boisterous. Um, I loved that and thrived in it. Um, I know that's super surprising. And the, you know, when you go to run your own firm and you start, particularly when you're small, it's just totally different. And I wasn't sure that it would give me the same level of um, satisfaction and that, it would, that, it would, that I'd get energized every day. It's been way better. You know, um, my afro's gone and I lost all my hair, um, which probably means the stress levels up. But it definitely has been, um, you know, a pleasure and far exceeding what I ever anticipated. Brendan, what's the biggest lesson or biggest surprise that you learned over the past few years? I think the biggest surprise, and I think it's not intellectually a surprise, but it's, it's a little bit like having kids. You don't really know what it's like until you've got them. Um, if you've worked, you know, if your background is working at other funds, working with other people, you have peers. You work with other people, you have peers. If something's going wrong, you can go complain to those peers. Um, when it's yours, it's you. And the way you behave and the way you act and who you talk, it all matters because you're setting the culture for the entire organization. Um, and that's, you know, the, the thing Jim Parsons, who, uh, who, who I worked with before, told me before I started, you know, the highs are higher and the lows are lower. Yeah. Um, and you kind of feel it more internally and the ability to socialize it out is, is, is less there. Um, and so it's one of those things, it's not, obviously I would say that, I would think everyone in the room would be like, yeah, duh, of course it is. Uh, but until you go through it, you don't know what it's like. Uh, and, and again, highs are higher, lows are lower. I think it nets out to being awesome. But prepare yourself for that. Yeah. And prepare yourself that it's different and how you behave matters. Alana, you've seen, you've seen so much from your vantage point. Tell us what the biggest surprise was for you. We'll, we'll save the biggest lesson for the last question. But no, what, what I, really I, was I, like? I, I just want to answer it this way. I mean, it nets out that it's awesome when you're successful. but the. The common, the most common thing I hear, I mean, I get this literally at least once a week from real managers. These aren't guys who couldn't cut it. These are guys who got to at least two, three, four hundred million. They had actually good returns, even with the volatility of the last couple of years, and they are either closing shop, and you just need to be aware of this, or they're just not having fun anymore. You talked about having fun and loving it. You go into this business for, you go into the idea of starting a fund. You're all emerging managers for two reasons. You believe in your strategy and you want to put it out into the world with your own imprimatur. And what you don't really realize, or maybe you realize it, but yes, like the having, having kids analogy, it's not until you're in the seat that it's really tangible. These two things, investor and entrepreneur, these two hats you need to wear, are actually in conflict with each other. Yeah. And every moment you spend, particularly as a new manager, not investing, and, and many of you will not be able to afford out of the gate the same infrastructure that these guys could. So you're going to get pulled into HR issues and legal issues and administration issues, and God, you're going to be dealing with LPs sometimes 100% of your time. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be trying to put up great performance. And that's exhausting. And it's sad, but there are many, I just have to tell the truth, there are many examples of individuals who got to a point where one might call them successful. They're running 400 million, 500 million. I have one guy who's running a billion and a half. His returns have suffered because of the distraction. Or they're just not having fun anymore because the thing that got them into this in the first place was a love of investing and they find themselves actually focused on a whole host of other issues, which really are not how they want to spend their time. So if this is what you really want to do, and it's an itch you want to scratch, you should go do it. But to the extent what you really want to do is have autonomy, invest, have scale out of the gate, have great resources, and not that fuss necessarily about all the rest of it, we should have that conversation. And if you do launch, and you launch successfully, We'll have that conversation too. 
Mike, what was the biggest <clears throat> lesson, biggest surprise to you? Yeah, you know, and Barry, you asked uh, this question when I was on another panel with mm -hmm. you a couple years ago. And uh, interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, it's the same answer. And you know, this is a talent-driven business. <clears throat> and what's been most surprising is the compounding effect of great talent. You always think about it in financial terms, but people who hire great people and keep the bar high, it's amazing what it does to your business. And so that's been the biggest surprise, it continues to be. So we're just about out of time. We don't have time for audience questions, but let me just throw one last question, 10 second response uh, from each of you, and we'll start with Tom. One piece of advice for someone about to launch a new fund. Um, just as I said earlier, just do what you love. Surround yourself with people that you that you really want to work with, and stay true to your initial objectives. Uh, one of which has to be to work as hard as you possibly can. Brandon, yeah, I would uh, kind of a corollary to that. Don't don't try to sell people on what you think that <clears throat> they want to hear. You have to come to market with a perspective. You have to have a strong point of view, and that either works or it doesn't. And <coughs> that's the bet you have to kind of underlying make, but it won't work. If you try to go, if you try to shoehorn it into something that it's not. Alana? Take your time with respect to hiring people. Build this in the right way. LPs would rather see a longer and slower ramp in, with respect to optimizing your investment team and your non-investment team and performance first. Focus on putting up the numbers. Final word, Mike, what do you got? I have to say, in honor of the late Sam Zell, who said this, Go for greatness. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Mike Rockefeller, Alana Weinstein, Tom Wagner, Brennan Diaz, thank you so much for your time and your insights. And uh, we're out of here. Thank you.